let's now turn our attention to real diodes. And uh, following the, the lead from ideal diodes, we've got our test circuit in which we want to explore the behavior and the characteristics of this diode D, which is now a real diode. Real diode being one we've purchased from some manufacturer. We have a, a variable DC voltage source, which VB, which can uh, output positive and negative voltages. It's connected to the diode via this current limiting resistor R. We are choosing to measure the diode voltage from the anode to the cathode and we are drawing the diode current uh, in this direction here. So we're going to vary VB over a range of voltages, negative and positive, and um, at each setting of VB we measure ID and VD and then plot the graph. Now the graph initially, the first time we look at it, it's a bit of a horror story because it doesn't look anything like the ideal characteristic. Now what I've got here is I've got two graphs um, but they are plotting the same data. The top graph is ID versus VD, the bottom graph is also ID versus VD. Uh, the top graph has a linear current scale, the bottom graph has a logarithmic current scale. Um, so we can see from the top graph that instead of the characteristic uh, hugging the current axis when VD is positive, um, it actually takes an appreciable forward voltage, VD, before the diode starts to conduct. And in fact it looks like the diode doesn't really conduct appreciably until around about 0.7 of a volt. Down here it looks like it's essentially zero, but we can expose this very low level behavior by plotting, <clears throat> by plotting the current on this logarithmic scale. And you can see that um, around about 0.7 of a volt, we've got 10 to the zero milliamps, so that's one milliamp. Uh, down here at 0.5 of a volt, we've got 10 to the minus three milliamps, that's one microamp there. Uh, down here, somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4 volts, we're down to 10 to the minus six milliamps, which is um, nanoamps. So the current is um, very, very small, and it's not until we um, get above about half a volt um, that we get any sort of current flow, and about 0.7 of a volt before we have an appreciable current flow. So just summarizing this forward characteristic, we see that very little current flows for VD less than half a volt. We only get appreciable current flow, namely in the milliamp range, for VD approximately greater than 0.7 of a volt. And just to give an idea of how rapidly the current increases, between VD equals 0.5 and 0.7 of a volt, so in the, in the space of 0.2 volts, ID increases by a factor of 1000. All right, so let's have a look at the reverse characteristic. So we now let VB go a little bit negative and we'll see what happens. So on this graph, we're still plotting the current versus the voltage, but now the origin zero, zero is here. We can see that for positive VD, um, the current's starting to increase. Now the scale is in nanoamps. So when we increase just a little bit, uh, maybe 20 millivolts or so, um, we've gone up to one nanoamp. In the reverse direction, instead of the characteristic hugging the line ID equals zero, um, it seems that the current, there is a current that's flowing in the reverse direction, so from the cathode to the anode. And it seems to saturate at this value here, and this is in fact called the reverse saturation current. It's small, it's in the order of one nanoamp for this device, but it's not zero. Okay, so we found two shocking things out about the real diode. One is that it doesn't start conducting until VD is about 0.7 of a volt. And now it actually passes current in the reverse direction. But we're looking uh, sort of microscopically at the behavior of the diode here. If we were to zoom out and have a more bird's eye view, we'd see a slightly different picture. Here's the real diode now, plotted on 
larger scale. Uh, the current now, we're back to milliamps, we're going maybe up to plus or minus 100 milliamps. The voltage is on a, on a much larger scale, here's 20 volts, going down to minus 120 volts. If we look very closely at this, you can see that that vertical line, well, it, it's just, just to the right of the line uh, VD equals zero. Okay, so that's our 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volt conduction happening there. Uh, in the reverse direction, when we are reverse biasing the diode, um, that reverse saturation current of one nanoamp is basically invisible, seen on this scale of plus or minus 100 milliamps. However, when we zoom out like this, we also see another strange behavior. When VD gets sufficiently negative, suddenly it starts conducting in the reverse direction substantially. And this is called reverse breakdown. For signal diodes or rectifying diodes, um, this is an undesirable uh, state of affairs and it's generally uh, unrecoverable. The diode usually catastrophically fails here, um, the insides of it melt and it's no longer a diode. If we take a, if we zoom in on this little area here, um, here we're plotting minus 110 to minus 111, so that's right around this area here. Uh, this is what the reverse breakdown looks like, and it's very similar to the forward conduction um, when VD is around 0.5 to 0.7 of a volt. Now, later on, um, when we look at Zener diodes, we will actually exploit this sort of behavior because although the forward voltage drop of 0.7 of a volt is fixed, it's fixed by the, um, the physics describing the energy levels in the silicon lattice, um, this reverse breakdown is controllable. And it's controllable in the sense that we can actually program the voltage at which this occurs. And we can also ensure that the breakdown is not catastrophic. So we can have the diode go into breakdown and come out of breakdown without any trouble. And the big use of that phenomenon is as a uh, voltage reference. All right, so this diagram here, with the exception of the reverse breakdown area, uh, does look very much like the ideal diode. And it's only when we need to concern ourselves with very small voltages around the origin that this thing starts to look uh, decidedly non-ideal. Now, amazingly, it's possible to derive an equation for the terminal characteristics of the real diode. It involves uh, knowledge of the physics of the majority and minority carrier uh, transport across the PN junction in here. We're not going to derive it, but this is the result. So this equation describes both forward bias and reverse bias, but it does not describe reverse breakdown. There are other versions of this equation which um, include reverse breakdown, but um, we won't be looking at them. So there's a few components to this equation. Uh, ID, of course, is the diode current. IS is the reverse saturation current that we saw in a previous graph, so the current that flows when the diode is reverse biased. We have VD, which is the voltage across the diode. And VT, which we call the thermal voltage. Now, IS is typically 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 14, which is significantly smaller than the value of IS I showed in my graph, which was about one nanoamp. That one nanoamp comes about largely through parasitic effects. This value of IS is a theoretical value, which if we had a perfect crystal lattice, uh, this is the value that results. In practice, the value is significantly higher, um, you know, a million times larger, um, because of imperfections. And the, um, the reverse saturation current doesn't just flow in the reverse direction uh, through the PN junction, but can essentially flow in the uh, 
um, the, the bulk material that the diode is made from. Okay, VT, the thermal voltage, is not the threshold voltage that we've talked about. Instead, it's a voltage which comes about through a combination of various constants at the PN junction. K is Boltzmann's constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, Q is the magnitude of the electron charge. And it works out that this um, combination is about 20 millivolt, uh, 26 millivolts at room temperature. Great, so we've got an equation for the diode. That means that we can use it when we're solving circuits, right? Instead of having to figure out is the diode in the conduction region or is it in the blocking region, we can just plug in the equation just like we do for the resistor. So here's an example of where we might do this. Here's our simple circuit, battery, resistor, diode. We can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. VB, the applied voltage, is equal to ID times RD plus the voltage across the diode. Well, ID is given by the diode equation, so we substitute that. But if we now need to solve this equation for VD, we can't do it. There's simply no way to rearrange this equation to get VD on one side and all the other symbols on the other. So the equation is nice and simple, it's compact, it's easy to understand, and basically unusable for us with pen and paper. That's not to say that we couldn't use it in numerical analysis software, and of course we do, um, uh, but for everyday use, this is no good to us. So what do we do? Well, um, we could just give up and just say we'll always do things with numerical analysis software, but then it makes it much harder for us to develop any sort of intuition about the operation of a circuit. What we would much rather do is develop some simplified models for this equation, which allows us to make reasonably accurate approximations um, that, uh, that we can do with pen and paper. And in doing so, we'll also develop our intuition and, um, and understanding for the operation of diodes in various circuits. So let's have a look at a few different models for the real diode. So when we had a look at the forward characteristic for the diode, there were a couple of things that stood out. One was that the voltage, the, um, the voltage across the diode was not zero when it was conducting. Um, and indeed it took about 0.7 of a volt in order to do that. So that would seem to be the sort of the largest issue we could address initially. And this is how we do it. Here on the left, we've got our real diode. And on the right, here's a simple model. We replace the real diode with an ideal diode in series with the threshold voltage. And it's pretty clear that the diode now won't conduct be until the voltage at the anode is greater than the voltage at the, the, uh, at the cathode, which is um, the threshold voltage. Right, so the voltage at the cathode is, say, 0.7 of a volt. So the anode voltage has to rise above 0.7 of a volt before this ideal diode will turn on. So here's what we have. The blue curve represents the real diode. The red curve represents what we're calling model 1, which accounts for the threshold voltage of the diode. When the diode is conducting, that is to say, when D ideal is on, the voltage from anode to cathode is just the voltage across this battery, B threshold. So we end up with this vertical line here at, say, 0.7 of a volt. When D ideal is not conducting, because the anode is less than 0.7 of a volt, or V threshold, then it's um, perfectly blocking, and we're on this red part of the curve that goes through there. So that's a significant improvement, and we, we can probably work with this model. It's very simple. Um, it consists of 
the ideal diode, which we already know how to work with, but with an integrated voltage source V threshold, which we would just take into account with our calculations and so on. The main drawback with this circuit, of course, is that it doesn't really account for the finite conductance when the diode is on. Okay, uh, Model 1 has infinite conductance when, um, when the diode is on. And in reality, the real diode doesn't have infinite conductance, and we can see that because uh, the blue curve is starting to diverge from the red curve at the top here. So the next thing to do then would be to augment this model with something that would account for the non-infinite slope um, of the diode. And the obvious thing to do there is to include a resistor in series with this ideal diode and the threshold voltage so that the voltage across the resistor increased as the current through the diode increased. And that will give us some slope. So let's have a look at the second diode model. So here we go. So we've now um, augmented our diagram with this uh, resistor that we're calling R on. So D real, which is this entire block here, consists of D ideal, the series resistor and the threshold voltage. And here's the result. As you can see, the model now doesn't have infinite slope there. In fact, the slope there is equal to 1 over R on. And it does a much better job of sticking to what the um, real diode is doing. Now, the way we normally do this is at the operating point, which uh, if I eyeball this, looks to me to be round about here somewhere maybe there. At the operating point, we want the model and the diode to coincide. So they have the same current and voltage. And we also want the model to have the same slope as the real diode at that point. And then we've done a pretty good job. Believe it or not, that's all there is to real diodes. We can already solve circuits involving ideal diodes. Real diodes now we will solve by including this on resistance, if we want model 2, and the threshold voltage. We've already got experience with ideal diodes connected to other voltage sources and resistors, so this presents no extra difficulty, either conceptually or uh, technically, when it comes to solving the circuits. So again, electronics, once we can linearize the nonlinearities, electronics really just boils down to being able to solve circuit problems.